Hello, everyone. This is the ninth in this series that I've begun a few weeks ago on views of death after life in the future in the ancient Western world. And this ninth video is very much of a capstone or even a keystone to the ones that went before. I'm very excited about this one. The working title is, Are Christians Following Plato or Jesus? when it comes to views of death and afterlife. We're gonna delve into that. Let me start though with sharing the screen because I want to say something about the series as a whole. Um, this is the backside of my YouTube channel where it shows the various uh, breakdown of the first eight programs. Uh, the beginning, the one right here, and you'll see this right at this top if you go to my uh, channel. That's an introduction. So you can see I started four weeks ago. This one is the first. And look at that, 159,000 views. I mean, for me, that's called viral. I had no idea. My videos usually get, you know, 11,000, 15,000, 20,000 is pretty good. And you can see that that's sort of the traffic that's held up here. Some are more, some are less. And I think one of the reasons this one might be getting so much is attached to it is a free article that I'll tell you about in just a minute that you can download and have that I wrote years ago that gives a survey of this in printed form of the things that I'm covering, at least in terms of the biblical material. So then I went to ancient Babylonian, Gilgamesh epic, and so forth, uh, Homer, all the way down to Plato. Uh, this was a special segment that had to do with uh, artifacts that had been found in tombs in the Mediterranean world. It was only nine minutes long, so it's not one of the full segments, but it fits in right here, and it's gotten a lot of traffic, as you can see. It's short and right to the point, 39,000 views. Now, from here on, this is number five, six, seven, and eight. These are very, very relevant to what I'm going to do today. So if you haven't seen any of these, watch this, uh, work with me here. But as you have questions or you're confused or you wonder why is he saying this or why is he saying that, uh, please give me the chance to explain and go back and maybe start with this one particularly, because that's kind of a fundamental one on biblical things, and that's what we're dealing with. And then the Hebrew revolution, uh, the origins of the idea of bodily resurrection, where did that come from? Who first suggested it? Uh, what is the meaning of resurrection? in our early Christian materials. It's not resuscitation of a corpse, if you really understand it. And then I did a special one last uh, time on the empty tomb, offering some reflections on that. So let me stop the share, and now I'm going to go to slides, and uh, we'll begin with this. So let me size this up here. I think that will be about right for everybody. Um, here's the article that you can get. So if you go to that uh, first one uh, of the Hebrew views, the ancient Hebrew views, you'll see the link in the description that you can click on and download the PDF. And uh, it's a tremendous article, I think, if I do say so. Uh, Morton Smith called me years ago and had me write it. And uh, it was in a book called What the Bible Really Says. So I had, uh, I was assigned the future and my mouth kind of dropped when he called me on the telephone. I remember I was standing in the kitchen in Williamsburg, Virginia. Remember those old kitchen phones? And uh, Dr. Smith called me from Columbia University and he said, James, we're working on something. It's a book, uh, What the Bible Really Says. And you can see all the topics here, capital punishment, marriage, divorce, miracles, and so forth. And he said, we want you to do the future. And I, I said, the Bible and the future? Are you kidding? Like the whole Bible and the whole future? I think it was the hardest article I've ever written because it had to be a certain number of words for a chapter. 
but I'm pretty pleased with it. I worked hard on it. I've used it for years in my classes. I teach regularly a course on death and afterlife in the ancient world. And this article gets everybody started. So you can have that and uh, just go back to that uh, number one. Now, for today, in getting into this idea of uh, are Christians following Plato or Jesus and Paul, I want to remind you and this was number five, this new Hebrew view of the future of the world. Uh, let me go right here. This is the very first one about the ancient Hebrew view. And it's a three-deck universe. It's a flat disk of the earth. Sheol is the underworld. That's the world of the dead, where a kind of shadowy, weak uh, substance of the person survives, but not the body. The body goes back to the dust. It's not really an immortal soul. It's actually called shades or shadows sometimes in the Hebrew Bible. So the, the dead exist in Sheol for sure. It's not annihilation. It's not non-existence. But they exist in a sleeping form often. It's called sleeping in the dust is one of the metaphors that's in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. And then you've got the earth, which is the place to be, the bright, lovely green earth and the firmament with the stars and sun and moon below and then the firmament of heaven and then God in the Bible, Yahweh or Jehovah is up above, El Elyon, God Most High, ruling it all. Now, what happens in terms of eschatology, the idea of the last things, is that view of the world continues, but you begin to talk about time, a kind of linear idea, a horizontal view of in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1, and then you move along through history and people who die fall off the line of history. They're not living anymore. This is the line of the living this is the world of the dead. So it's just a different schematic with time added. In this one, you just have this endless repetition of people being born and dying, people being born and dying, and the whole story of what happens on the planet. Not always good, by the way, as you well know. Uh, but here you get some hope because what's going on here the kind of tangled mess of life, as I often say, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is moving towards something. And so in biblical parlance, this is called this age. And once you get to the end, it's not the end of the world, it's the end of this age, then you have a new age. A new age, it includes the kingdom of God, a final judgment, the resurrection of the dead. So at that point, the dead come forth from the state of being dead. Don't think of this so much as a place that might be okay for a five-year-old or a child, but more a state of being. Now, it is when you die, according to Genesis, this is the Hebrew view, uh, dust you are and to dust you will return. Abraham says at one point in the book of Genesis, O oh Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Uh, it's the idea of that fragile self. Now, I explain in that very first lecture that a lot of mistranslation takes place. I've got my translation of Genesis here that I recommend for a lot of these things. But if you remember Genesis 2, 6, God breathes into Adam, the first human, the breath of life, and man, Adam, becomes a living soul. That's King James, and it's a really bad translation. Because they people read that and they think, oh, humans have the breath of life and they're living souls. Animals are just living creatures. It's the same word in Hebrew. It's literally nefesh kaya, a living breather. So Adam's a living breather. He starts breathing. He's alive. All the living, breathing creatures the land animals down to the insects, the reptiles, and so forth are living breathers. Same exact word in Hebrew. So humans go to a state, 
let's call it of Sheol, but it was thought of as under the earth because you bury bodies and somehow the person's essence is, is down below, but it's not hell. There's no torture or anything. We went over all that. I'm not going to repeat everything here because uh, many of you have followed, but you can catch up. Hades is just the Greek term. So in the New Testament, you're going to have Hades. Hades actually means the unseen realm. Sheol, we're not sure, but it might even mean like, what is it? <laughs> uh, the idea of mystery when something dies. So there's the old view. This is the view of time. Now, when you get to the Hellenistic period, this would be three, 400 BC, really from Plato on through. And Plato's the dominant figure. He doesn't originate all this. If you look at my Homer to Plato uh, video, you'll see I, I cover it more thoroughly. I want to mention here Jonathan Z. Smith, who was my teacher at the University of Chicago. He's now passed away. I was honored to write my dissertation under him and at his direction, and it was a, a humbling experience. He's absolutely brilliant. I think many of us in the field would agree that in terms of our generation of the 20th and into the 21st century, Smith is really the one. Next to Eliade, it's Jonathan Smith, and both of them were at Chicago, and they were good friends. But Smith specialized particularly in Hellenistic religions or religions of the Mediterranean world, although he really wandered widely over the whole range of human religious experience. But in the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is the most important article you could read, I'm telling you. It's an amazing piece of work. You can get it online, I believe. There might be a small fee, but boy, it's worth its weight in gold. Uh, it's just a short article where Smith basically puts down for you what it is to go from this, what she calls the archaic view of the world, to this modern, back in those days, Hellenistic view. What we get in the Hellenistic period is a vastly expanded universe. Instead of just a little bit of a dome over the earth, you notice here, you have the earth and then the air and fire and then the planets. The moon was thought of as a planet, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the sun. And then beyond is the heavenly world. Here's another representation that I like more. Uh, down, here's the earth down below. That's where we are. And then as you begin to ascend up through the planetary spheres, and these are powerful forces. They're called by Paul, the stoicheia tu cosmo, the elemental spirits of the universe or of the world, the cosmos. And they essentially are the world below, up above and outside we could call this beyond the seventh heaven. This is the seventh ring. Uh, you have divinity. Now, in the Hellenistic period, the common perception is not the Hebrew view. It's the idea that humans belong in the heavens, that heaven is where they really came from, and their souls were split off. And in some texts, like Poimandris, uh, in my book, uh, this is my dissertation that I wrote under Smith, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. I have a long chapter on heavenly ascent in the ancient world that uh, goes into texts like Poimandris, uh, which is very important, or Plato's Timaeus. But the basic idea as it gets taken into the Hebrew tradition is that we are points of light, our immortal souls, and they've fallen down through the spheres into this world of darkness. And we are basically trapped here. We're out of place. So as Smith argues, salvation in the Hellenistic world becomes how do you get out? How do you save your soul and not go even below into the world of Hades where you can get judged and then reborn and maybe die and get judged and reborn again and again in a cycle. But like Socrates, 
you can drink the hemlock and believe that your soul is going to transcend the body. The body is nothing. The body is simply a prison holding you back. And this is kind of double dualism. You're trapped by your body, your physical body, and you're also trapped as you look up into the cosmos. You have no power to escape. You're essentially a prisoner. You're a stranger in a strange land. Here's the quote from one of those golden tablets that we find in those tombs. You're supposed to, in the world of the dead, declare to the powers so they'll let you out and let you rise up. I am a child of earth and starry heaven, but heaven alone is my home. This idea that on the earth, this is not where you belong. You really belong up here in heaven. Does that sound kind of familiar? Uh, think of all the Christian hymns. This world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. My home is somewhere beyond the blue and so forth. And the idea that Jesus will come and take you home and take you away and rescue you. In the Hellenistic period, we have a number of religions. The Mithras liturgy, I also cover that in the book, is very interesting. It's part of the it's part of the great magical papyri of Paris, and it actually tells you how to obtain the force and power of a god that will help guide you up through the heavens. When Paul ascends up to the third heaven and then into paradise, he has to know how to negotiate that, and he is our first person witness to someone who says, I did that, and we can learn quite a bit about him as we study. So the Hellenistic world is a new world. It's a world in which humans see themselves as fallen from the world of light, diamonds in the muck, you might say, with immortal souls trapped in the lower world. Question is, how do we get out? How do we get home? Now, um, if you look at two Jewish figures, I'm going to mention Josephus here in this article, which you can get free of charge on my blog, jamestaver.com. Uh, I wrote it years ago. And Philo, whenever you take these two uh, Jewish figures, Philo and Josephus, Jews are thinking of Moses as a celibate devotee of a kind of Hellenistic view of the universe. Uh, denying his body, denying sexuality, so that he can free his soul and go to the higher world. So you can get that article. Now, I want to remind you from the previous segments, when I talked about the views of Jesus and Paul, uh, before we go into whether Christians are following Plato or Jesus and Paul, what did Jesus and Paul say? Uh, Mark is our earliest and first gospel. Some of you have taken my Mark course. You can still take it. Uh, I might put in a little plug here because we have regular Zoom meetings where we get the students together. And I'll put the link in the description. I always do on these videos. But in this story, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but Jesus is asked and challenged by the Sadducees as to how could there be a resurrection of the dead. And all of our evidence places Jesus and Paul on the side of the Pharisees in that they believe that the dead at the end of the age are going to come forth from the dead. The question is, what kind of a body do they come in? So if you're just talking about a resuscitated corpse of people appearing like Jesus in the Gospels uh, raises people from the dead, several People three different times are recounted, Lazarus being the best known in the Gospel of John. That's not really resurrection of the dead as Jesus answers the question, because he's talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those who've gone before who were God's people. And what he says is, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, that's not because they're celibate. It's because they've been transformed into this new state but they're like angels in heaven. Now, Luke takes Mark's tiny little statement and expands it, I think, in a proper direction, just to make it clearer to readers. The sons of this age, remember the line of this age and the age to come. 
the children or the sons, the people of this age, marry and are given in marriage. Now notice the language. But those who were accounted worthy to attain to that age. So it's the idea that you would want to be there and you would have to, by God's grace, enter into that new age. You're accounted worthy and to the resurrection of the dead. So it's talking about a different kind of resurrection. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they're equal to angels and are sons of God, children of God, being sons of the resurrection, being children of the resurrection. So Luke uses those phrases, and I think it's in keeping with Mark's essential idea, but it expands it a little bit, lest you think it means something like, oh, they don't get married. Uh, but it's much more than that. They've become immortal beings. They are these glorified children of God. It is very much a Paul idea, whether Paul originated or not, or Jesus, we're not sure, because Mark comes after Jesus. But we can be pretty certain that Jesus, in his own time, held views very similar to this, uh, because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we have in our earliest source where Jesus is asked about the signs of the Messiah, and he talks about the dead are raised. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we also have a text that talks about the Messiah raising the dead at the end of the age. So then uh, is added, Mark has this too, but since I just put Luke here, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed and this is a proof that the dead are raised that we find in other Jewish texts. Because if you look at the Torah or the Hebrew Bible from Genesis through Deuteronomy and into the prophets, there's very little that you could even possibly mistake or take as resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. Daniel, yes, we saw that, Daniel 12. Many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting glory they're going to shine like the stars here you get this astral immortality idea even in the book of daniel and others will experience judgment and shame and contempt so this argument that when moses is facing the burning bush and hears the voice of god and what does god say i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now notice this phrase, for all live to him, meaning the dead in Sheol or Hades, according to this view of in the mouth of Jesus here, and I think Paul agrees with it as well, the dead are in the hands of God. Uh, the book of Revelation says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors and their works follow them. They're good works. Uh, we also looked at Revelation 20, where the dead come forth from the tomb, and death and Hades give up the dead that are in it. This is resurrection at the end of the age. Even the sea, the oceans, give up the dead that are in them. So as we covered already, we're not talking about finding body parts or skeletons or anything of that nature, but the idea that these people long ago perished in the dust, but in God's keeping still exist, but in a disembodied state. It's not the resurrection yet. So we'll go on. Now, Paul, just a summary of Paul. Just This is just to remind us before we go to uh, the main point of our Christians following Plato or Jesus and Paul. What Paul believes is that at the coming of Jesus, it's called the parousia, the appearance of Jesus, the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, that there will be a secret reveal. So here he says, lo, behold, I tell you a secret, a mystery, as it's translated. We shall not all sleep. Sleep is death. That's the metaphor Paul uses. You sleep in the dust, okay? We shall not all sleep. He's saying when when the he expects to live to see this. So he says, we, everybody's not going to die. Some are going to die. But we, the living, he thinks he'll be alive, will be changed. And it's the word metamorphosis, just like 
we use for a caterpillar to a butterfly. The caterpillar is not the butterfly, but the caterpillar dissolves itself in a cocoon, a tomb, and becomes the butterfly. It emerges. It's not a perfect analogy. Paul also uses the idea of a seed. You plant a seed, he says it dies, it perishes, goes back to the dust, but in it comes forth something that's very different from what was planted. Now, when will that happen? In the blink of an eye, in a moment, in the blink of an eye or twinkling of an eye, this is the RSV, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. This is basically the old idea of Gabriel blowing his horn. And the dead will be raised imperishable. So if they're already in heaven and their mortal souls have gone to heaven, uh, what are we talking about here? It says the dead, those who sleep, will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So whether you're living or dead at the coming or the return of Jesus, this is Paul's view, you will be metamorphosized. You will be translated into this new state. Well, what will that be like? For this perishable nature, your physical body, will put on the imperishable. And this mortal nature will put on immortality. So you don't have it now. You're going to put it on like clothing. When you take off your body, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, you're naked. And he says, that's not what we want. Plato wants to be naked. He wants to get away from the body, from the prison of the body. But in Genesis, the world is a good place. And Adam 1, made of dust, is a good creation. Very good, in fact. Remember how it's repeated in that first chapter. And God blesses human beings and says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and so forth. But they're mortal. So you put on immortality like a new body, a new clothing. A body is a mode of existence. So the shadows or the shades of the dead exist, but their mode of existence in terms of being active in the new world that's going to come, the new age, uh, they have to have a body. So when the perishable puts on the imperishable, this is like clothing again, and the mortal puts on immortality, so you put it on, you don't have it, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he goes on with that famous refrain, O death, where is your sting, and so forth. And he also says in this chapter, this is all 1 Corinthians 15, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So death is not a friend. Remember in the Phaedo, which has the death of Socrates, death is a friend, a welcome friend. And Socrates says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. You're the ones that have to stay behind in this lower world in which we live trapped in the prison of the body. This is not the Hebrew view. This is not Paul's view. Now, if you ask Paul, as he covers in this very chapter, and I'm not going to repeat the whole lecture again, uh, but what kind of a body? What are you talking about? What does it look like? He says, look, I can't tell you, but it's powerful, it's glorious, and it's immortal. And you see these terms right here. So uh, whatever Paul saw when he says, I've seen the Lord, He's not seeing a resuscitated corpse. Uh, this is that painting I put up before. I think Paul has this kind of a view uh, that the dead in Christ will rise. This particular artist who happens to be my son, David, now deceased, sadly, but his uh, work lives on here. Uh, he did make this sort of six foot figures. I didn't ask him uh to do it in a certain way, but I was talking to him about Paul's view of something kind of coming forth from the earth, but in a transformed state, uh, reclothed, so to speak. And I thought it was uh, a nice idea of a sort of a light being. If you've ever seen that movie Cocoon years ago, I love that movie because remember those beings that come from another planet uh, are clothed with skin but when they take off their skin, they have these uh, bodies of light and they can move around very quickly and so forth. It's kind of a cool idea. Now, 
Let's get to a comparison. What does Plato have to do with Jesus and Paul? Uh, should we say never shall the twain meet, that is Jesus and Paul and Plato? And I'm using Plato to mean this whole Hellenistic dualism that takes over the world in, in, in the Hellenistic period on down to our day today. Uh, Oscar Kuhlman, here he is. He was born in 1902. He lived right up to the 1999, remember Y2K, some of you old enough. He died January 16th, 1999, uh, just before the turn of the millennium. He was a professor at the University of Strasbourg, later at Basel. Uh, Strasbourg, he held the position that Albert Schweitzer once held before he became a medical missionary. Uh, this is in Alsace, and it's both French and German. Uh, as you know, if you know something about European history, with the Germans and the French contesting it over the years. But he wrote this famous book. It was actually a set of lectures, as I'll explain, Immortality of the Soul or Resurrection of the Dead. I want you to get this book. I'm going to give you a link of the edition because it's long ago out of print. But you can get this version here, and I'm going to tell you how to do that. Uh, in the description to this lecture. So here it is, Oscar Kuhlman, Immortal the Soul, Resurrection of the Dead. It was the Ingersoll Lectures that Harvard University has, 1954, 1955, this series of lectures, and notice it's either or. Is Christianity based on the idea of the immortality of the soul or the resurrection of the dead? Remember Paul's ask, by his Corinthian followers who are thinking very Greek, very Platonic. What do you mean resurrection of the dead? What kind of a body are you talking about? Uh, how, how could bodies come forth? And Paul says, well, God will give those who have died in Christ, he says, a body as it pleases him. But he can't, he can't describe it for you. So it's not a corpse coming back. It's something totally transformed. In Greek tradition, we call that apotheosis. It's becoming like a god, becoming divinized. And that's what Luke said. Uh, these ones who attain the resurrection in the new age won't marry or give in marriage because they're transformed beings. They're not really male or female anymore. All distinctions of human society and culture have disappeared and now they're part of this new race or genus of beings actually spirit beings uh, paul refers to jesus as the firstborn of many to come and he calls him a life-giving spirit now what coleman argued in these lectures is that 1 Corinthians 15, that resurrection chapter, or I like to call it the transformation chapter, the eschatological transformation chapter, there's a mouthful for you, that it has been sacrificed for the Phaedo. The Phaedo is the argument that Plato wrote, putting it in the mouth of Socrates, his teacher, for the immortality of the soul that argues for the prison of the body that argues that it's much better to leave the cave, remember Plato's allegory of the cave, and to rise up out of the cave into the world of light and life, which is not this world. This lower world that we're trapped in is the cave, and we're doubly trapped, as I said, in our bodies. So Coleman argued that basically we've lost our way. Coleman was very well known in his time, and this essay had a tremendous influence. I read it years ago in college, and it just rocked my world. I really hadn't had things straight. Lots of people in the field of New Testament are aware of this, but I don't think many in the public have gotten onto it. But I would really recommend you read it. I'm going to give you a good summary right now. Uh, Coleman moved in circles such as Rudolf Bultmann, one of the great German New Testament scholars, Karl Barth. Uh, B-A-R-T-H, uh, Albert Schweitzer, 
He knew all of these people. He was in dialogue and even discussions with them about all of these things. And his field was New Testament studies. Now, here's his fundamental thesis. Coleman's fundamental thesis that resulted in great controversy. And so when Coleman laid down his ideas, he got lots of hate letters and hate mail. Back then, they didn't have the internet, or he would have just been flooded with death threats, probably. But the idea would be, you've taken away our Christian hope. And what he answered in reply, and he would answer a lot of these letters by hand, is, no, my dear friend, the Christian hope is you sleep in the dust until the return of Jesus, this is the Christian hope, who will raise you from the dead and give you this new glorified body, but you don't have it yet. Now, I know immediately uh, people can start thinking about, oh, wait, in Philippians, doesn't Paul talk about departing and being with Christ? And doesn't it say somewhere that the souls of the righteous go to heaven when they die or something like that? I'm not going to cover all of those things today, but in the next lecture, I call it tying up loose ends. I will cover every one of those things that might be popping in your head. But stay with me here. Let's talk about Coleman's idea, such a groundbreaking idea. So it resulted in great controversy. Here it is, that primitive, as it's often used, in other words, early Christianity's view of the notion of resurrection of the dead is in sharp contrast to the Greek idea of the intrinsic immortality of the soul. With the idea of Plato and Socrates, as he's represented by Plato, you already have immortality. It's part of your very nature, of the real inner self. Uh, I covered already in a previous uh, lecture, uh, Cicero, the Roman writer, and his account of the dream of Scipio Africanus, who rises up to heaven and meets the dead in starry heaven. And he's given a little tutorial looking down at the earth about what it's all about. And one of the things that he's told is that you that can be pointed out by a finger, that is, I point at you, you point at me, that's not you, that's just your body. That's your tent, that's your clothing, that's your temporary dwelling. The you is the inner soul. So you intrinsically already have immortality. Later, Christian theologians forged a fusion between the two views, essentially equating them. And that's why people today think the basic idea of Plato, remember, uh, where are you going to bury me? He says, Crito asks him, where, where should we bury you? He says, uh, anywhere you want, if you can catch me, meaning catch me if you can, because clearly bury you, Socrates, uh, you can't bury me because I'm headed up to the stars. You might bury the clothing I used to live in. Coleman is convinced that such a fusion robs us of an essential and unique aspect of early Christianity's view of both the resurrection of the dead and the new creation. Paul and Jesus versus the Phaedo. That's basically what he's arguing. Now, here are his propositions. And we'll just go through them very quickly. Resurrection of the dead and thus immortality or eternal life is based upon a cosmic event, not the natural dualistic state of human beings as an essential immortal soul imprisoned in a material perishable body. So here's the Greek view, and this is the view of resurrection, at least according to Jesus and Paul. Now, what do I mean a cosmic event? Well, we just read it in Paul. I show you a mystery. At the parousia, or the appearance, Paul believed that those who are dead and asleep in the dust would come forth already translated into this imperishable new body. Secondly, death is an enemy, howbeit conquered. So death has been conquered, but it's never a friend. Uh, Plato, Socrates, welcomes death as a friend. The deliverer, the one who takes you out of this lower dark world 
and helps you ascend up into the heavens if your soul is ready so that you can go home. Remember the quote again. I am a child of earth and starry heaven, but heaven alone is my home. Sounds Christian, not according to this. Next, the death of the body is a destruction of life, not a prison or a vessel of the self, but an integral part of each person's whole being. Resurrection is a cosmic miracle in which the whole person is recalled to life by a new act of creation. So Adam one is a prototype, dust of the earth, and when he dies to dust, he returns. Adam two is a dust creature, according to Paul, Jesus of Nazareth, but he now becomes the last Adam, and the last Adam gets transformed into this spirit being, this heavenly being with the spiritual body. So that's not natural that's a creative act that has to do with creating the new age uh what the book of revelation calls a new heavens and new earth next death in the hebrew christian view is not something natural or will by god but comes as a consequence of sin in other words if you have the knowledge of good and evil you've come of age then you experience both good and evil and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's Paul in Romans. So you can see how heavily Kuhlmann, these are Kuhlmann's ideas. We're just trying to get hold of his ideas. The death of the body is a destruction of life, not a prisoner vessel of the self, but an integral part of each person's whole being. Resurrection is a cosmic miracle in which the whole person is brought forth from death in a glorious, indescribable body as a new act of creation. So it's a very similar statement, but just expanding it a little bit. Next, the body is part of the good creation of God, the full human person or Adam made of dust who became a living being, a living breather, literally. The physical creation then is subject to decay, but only temporarily. Now, this is something I haven't talked about much, but in Romans 8, 18 through 25, Paul doesn't simply talk about those who are Christ being raised incorruptible. He says the catissus, the creation itself, has been subject to decay, just like your mortal body, and it is yearning for release also and will be set free from what's called its bondage to decay. And that would be a new earth in which there's no death. Death is swallowed up with life and there's no more mourning or sighing and God wipes away all the tears and so forth in all of those texts. The inner person is not a full person without the outer or body. You gotta have a body. The body is your mode of existence. It's also your individuality. Paul's view is not that one, when you die, your soul kind of disappears into the cosmos. Uh, that would be the view of the Stoics, and in some cases, Epicureans and other Greek philosophers. But the body is your mode of existence as well as your individual identity. In other words, it will be you raised from the dead. Uh, you will be recognized as a self, but now with a mode of existence, not just existing in the state of death. Hence, Paul's analogy of putting off the old clothing, being naked, and then being reclothed with a immortal body. So in your naked state, Paul says, this is 2 Corinthians 5, we are naked when we die, as we don't have a body. But he says, that's not, he says, not that we want that. That's not what we want. It's a, it's an interim state. And then the reclothing or the immortalization of that self comes later at the end of the age. Christ is the firstborn of a new cosmic family of glorified atoms. Now, these are atoms of the spirit. Uh, they become spirit beings, the firstborn from the dead. This is not resuscitation of a corpse, which would be almost comical to think about, but transformation or glorification of that essential 
naked self sleeping or resting in the hand of God. So are the dead with God, with Christ? Of course they are. That's what Jesus is trying to get at when he says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They live to him or in him, but they haven't been raised from the dead yet. And that's why Jesus in some of the earliest sources, like the Q source, talks about you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. That's when the kingdom of God comes. There are lots of sayings along those lines. Also find that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. When the Messiahs come and the Dead Sea Scrolls and there's a messianic banquet and the dead also are raised and participate, those who've gone before. Finally, the transformation or glorification comes at the end of the age, not when one dies. So far, according to Paul, Jesus is the firstborn of many to come, and the creation is still groaning in a state of decay, waiting for its renewal or the new creation, just as the dead are waiting for their transformation or metamorphosis. Thus, there is an interim state in which the dead are spoken of as asleep. Now, again, loose ends. We'll talk about those in the next uh, video, number 10. But for now, we're taking the overview that Coleman laid out. Christians are with Christ as far as presence, but not yet in their new glorified state. They too are waiting the resurrection. Okay. Now, I put this on the screen for you in a kind of type fashion because I thought some of you might want to do a screenshot and then print it out. This is oversimplified, let me say that as I begin. Uh, these are not airtight compartments, but I think you're gonna notice that there are some definite contrasts that have to do with perceptions of the world, perceptions of the human place, perceptions of human purpose and future, and how death and afterlife and the future are affected. Over here, where I have the cursor, is the Hellenistic Greek view that we're using the word Plato as shorthand for. The material world, our body, is a prison of the soul. Humans are immortal souls fallen into the darkness of the lower world. Death sets the soul free from the body. There's no human history, just a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. That is, if you ask, what is the story of the great year of Plato, which lasts thousands and thousands of years? It's the cycles of all the planetary spheres and so forth. What is the history of all those cycles? Essentially to repeat again, until all the souls are somehow redeemed or just stay in Hades, perhaps. We're not sure. But there's this reincarnation idea. Immortality is inherent for all humans. If you're a human being, you already have eternal life. You already have immortal soul. You just need to get out of prison. Salvation is escape to heaven, the true home of the immortal soul. We've talked about that. Humans are fallen and misplaced. The world is not your home. Death is stripping of the body so the soul can be free. Death is a liberating friend to be welcomed. Asceticism is the moral ideal for the soul. So what you should do is feed the soul, not the body. So this idea of denying the flesh, of living an ascetic life, is very much part of early Christianity, and it's thought of as a higher way. Now, Paul does talk about suffering, but that's a completely different idea, and I'll try to clarify that uh, as we go into uh, the next video, number 10 because his idea of suffering has to do with being persecuted, not like deliberately starving yourself or having no pleasure or denying your sexuality so that you can somehow uh, nourish the soul so that it's ready to depart this dark world below and rise up to the starry heavens. That's not his view. We've already seen that in his writings. So this is very much world denying. This one is world-affirming. It's a kind of a Genesis 1, 2, and 3 view. 
the creation or body is very good. Procreation is good. In Genesis 1, the first commandment given human beings, according to the rabbis, there's 613 commands in the Torah. And the first one is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Procreation is good. The earth is called good, 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 very good. Humans are living breathers akin to animals, mortal dust of the earth. So what is a human being? A living breather. What is a dog or a cat? A living breather. What is a insect? A living breather. What happens when you die? You go back to the dust. However, with humans, the shadow of the self in the world of the dead is kept in the hand of God. Death is dark, silent, sleeping in the dust. We saw all those texts. Human history moves toward a perfected new age. In other words, it's going somewhere. It's not this endless cycle of birth, death, rebirth, death, rebirth, death. Freedom from decay comes with the new age, not when you die. Salvation is eternal life in the perfected world of the new creation. Humans belong on earth. It is their home. Resurrection brings a new, transformed, glorious spiritual body. Death is an enemy to be conquered, not a friend to be welcomed. Physical life and sensory pleasures are good. Uh, Gilgamesh is told, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Rejoice with your wife, with your children, with the things you have in life. Because the gods have immortality and you don't. Genesis 3, the first man and woman are expelled from Eden and they have no access to the tree of life. And they're told, dust you are, and to dust you will return. All the figures in the Hebrew Bible, from Adam on down, they breathe their last, they die, they're buried, they return to the dust. But they still exist as a shade or shadow of their former self in Sheol, in Hades, in the hand of God, at least that's Paul's view and the view of Jesus. So that's an overview. Like I said, there's some overlaps. There, these are not absolutely airtight categories, but I think you can see the difference. And this is the old view of the old world, you might say, the ancient Near Eastern view, really, uh, but modified so that it's going to get transformed into something new and utopian. This is the new Hellenistic view that says that utopia is already in heaven waiting for you, but you've fallen into the world below and you just need to get out and get away and be saved. Okay, again, we're going to tie up the loose ends, so just follow the main trend today. Now, this is the last slide. Matthias Grunwald at the Eisenheim Museum has these altar panels, and I'm just picking two. Here's one below the altar. You've got Jesus dead with the women attending to his body. That's death. And then he's one of the few painters that shows resurrection in a glorious heavenly state. Even though he makes it like a human figure, you can see the glory coming out of the empty tomb. And the clothing is left behind, like the old body is left behind, and now he's in this glorified state. What did Paul see? Maybe something like this light, but without the face and arms, I think. But what he says is God will give those in Christ who are dead a body and also the living as it pleases him, glorified, immortal, and powerful. Like angels, and Paul thinks beyond angels because he sees Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And Jesus says in the book of Revelation, if you overcome and keep my word and my way, I will give you a seat on the throne next to me as I overcame and sat next to my father in heaven. So basically, Paul has the idea and Jesus has the idea that at the resurrection at the end of the age, there will be this mass apotheosis. Revelation 20, we went over before, the sea gives up the dead, the land gives up the dead that are in it. Everybody gathers together and is judged according to what they have done, 
and the names that are written in the book of life. And so uh, that's essentially the view. So I'm gonna stop the share. So I hope this is meaningful to you. Um, all the questions that you have, I'll try to address next time. I think I know what they are. And there are some anomalies. There are some things to talk about and discuss. But very clearly, this is the mainstream view that runs through the New Testament. I won't repeat it again, but I want to tell you where we're going from here. So next time, loose ends, and that'll be number 10. And then we have 11 and 12. There, there are 12 all together. And when we go into 11, I want to deal with uh, what happened in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries, from Gnosticism to Augustine, uh, the church father, Augustine, who wrote City of God and wrote the Confessions, and we'll talk about that as well. How did they Platonize the basic Pauline teaching about the new body? How did they work it out? Because basically... They're following Plato more than Paul or Jesus. Uh, and, and it's just irresistible to kind of think of this immortal soul, it seems. I think the main reason is comfort. You know, if you picture that timeline and Paul says, and we who are alive, that's easy to wait for. But what if a thousand years go by? What if 2000 years go by? People bury their loved ones in the soil, in the dirt, and whether they're embalmed or not, eventually they're going to go back to the earth. And some are cremated and already scattered or going back to the earth. And uh, the question is, well, what happens? How long do you have to wait? And this idea that you see all the time at Christian funerals, where the preacher will often get up in the service and have the casket right in front sometimes even open, and will tell the crowd, don't weep for Charles who died. Charles is in heaven with Christ. His soul went to be with God. This is just the mortal body. It's just the shell, and we're going to put it back in the earth. But then they go out to the cemetery to do the burial ceremony, and the liturgy is different. You read passages about how on that last great day we believe the dead will come forth immortalized in this new wonderful spiritual body. Uh, so putting those two together is a little bit difficult, but I think it can be done, but you can see why people want comfort. I've been watching the series Outlander and season seven, I think it's episode three, has this burial and the main character, Jamie Fraser, quotes by heart, I guess he has it memorized, this poem about death don't boast oh death because you're defeated and they're burying a body of a woman that died and her husband is standing at the end of the scene looking at the ground with the fresh soil covering her body and jamie fraser the main male character quotes john dunn and it ends by saying after a sweet short sleep of death we will awaken to this new world. And uh, it's interesting that Dunn puts that kind of language. I think I'll put the Dunn poem into the description. Uh, I was going to put the video in at the end, but it's copy protected and uh, don't have permission to use it since it's just come out. But even a clip of it, I think, would get uh, flagged as copyrighted. It has music with it. But I'll put the poem in. It's kind of a moving poem from John Donne, the great poet. So take care, everybody. Uh, dig in. Uh, get Coleman's book. Uh, you'll see the link here and in the description. And I think uh, we're going to move on.